Hi guys, welcome back. The next topic we're studying is Takotosubo cardiomyopathy, which is also called as broken heart syndrome. This condition actually occurs due to excess of catecholamines. Now, when I say that, the query of most students is that, sir, catecholamines are protective. In physiology, we have studied regarding fight or flight phenomenon. I'll put it like this. You come out of your bank after withdrawing your salary and somebody is standing outside with a big knife and says, hand me over all your money. Well, I would be more than happy to hand him all the money and say, sir, please let me go because I don't want to be stabbed by this guy. On the other hand, let me say it's a puny guy, a short guy, and he's trying to threaten me. I might actually give him a sucker punch and this guy will actually lose consciousness. But the point is not boasting, but the point is, the point is that guys, catecholamines are going to be protective in nature. But in this particular condition that I'm going to explain to you, catecholamines can be life threatening. So we need to understand what is really going wrong in this case and why is this particular nomenclature and at this junction when I write the word broken heart syndrome, I want you to remember that the word Takota Subo per se is from Japanese language and Takota Subo highlights the fact that there is a, a rather a jar that is used to trap an octopus. Now, how is an octopus related to cardiology is what we need to understand. The bottom line is that in this condition, there will be so much of catecholamines released. I'll give you reasons also. But the point is, the moment the catecholamine surge will occur, that's supra-physiological levels of catecholamine in the body after maybe an intense emotional trauma, the same catecholamines will now damage the myocardium. It will cause a change in the shape of the left ventricle, especially the apical part of the heart might balloon out. And this is what is highlighted. If you look at the shape here, the shape of the heart per se, you see what the importance is guys, that the shape of the left ventricle is responsible for the effective hemodynamics. If there's going to be a catecholamine induced damage to the myocardium, then the effective hemodynamics are lost and the heart is not able to pump properly and therefore there's a cardiogenic shock developing in a patient. I highlight the fact once again that Takotosubo in Japanese basically means a jar that is used to trap an octopus. The octopus head once it will get stuck in this area, then it will not be able to come out. So this ballooning that is occurring of especially the apical part of the heart. It could be actually any wall of the heart per se, but usually it is the apical part of the heart. So that's why the name given is uh, octopus trap slash takotosubo cardiomyopathy. As I said, catecholamine surge is occurring. Why? It is due to intense emotional trauma. Now to explain this, I can actually re relate to certain media events also, which I mean, those events have been widely circulated on YouTube and I would say Facebook, Insta, social media. Uh, let me say a uh, husband died. And uh, while coming back from the cremation ground, within two hours, the wife also died. I mean, I'm talking about a couple who were madly in love. They were married for 50 plus years. And the wife is so heartbroken because of the demise of her husband that she actually died. And maybe she told her son, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, just going, I'm just going to meet my husband, right? And the son is telling you that my mom told me that I'm going to uh, go with my father to heaven. I mean, that's how people with non-medical people will talk. You and me as doctors don't believe in heaven, etc. But the bottom line is there has to be an intense emotional trauma. And please appreciate here, the intense emotional trauma is not about a boyfriend, girlfriend breakup. I'm talking about uh, somebody who has been crazily in love for a large number of years. And it's not going to be related only between a, from the perspective of a husband and a wife. I can give an example of a soldier and a sad story again. This soldier was posted at Siachen Glacier and uh, well, he was uh, shot by the Chinese. There was a headshot. Now, when the body of the son was brought back to the village, when the mother saw that injury to her son that his brains were actually blown out, she just lost it and uh, she had so much of intense emotional trauma that the mother also died. So we do hear about such kind of stories where even after death of a pet dog, a lady in South Delhi died. So, I mean, we, we have to realize that there is some connection between this intense emotional trauma and damage to the heart. And I'll, I'll give you a clinical example that will make you understand this basic concept relatively better. So let's look up a real time scenario that I have read. This is a 60 year old lady. And uh, she got trapped in an elevator like at the moment earthquake was occurring and because of this the electricity went out and she was trapped in the elevator for only maybe five minutes or so. You see you can put yourself in that situation that there is an earthquake happening. Now normally during earthquake uh, they always advise do not take the lift, do not take the elevator and go via stairs. But maybe she was having some arthritis problem, osteoarthritis or bilateral knee so she could not obviously climb down the stairs so she decided to take the lift. 
and the moment she went into the lift and the lift started descending the electricity went off because of the earthquake and the lift was stuck and the whole lift was shaking vigorously the building was shaking vigorously and this lady had was a near death experience because you see if you are stuck in middle of a earthquake that is itself so a uh, emotionally charged issue that if you are inside a lift and there's no electricity it's all dark and you never know when the lift is going to crash that's really going to be a near death experience for anybody luckily for this lady she was rescued and she was rushed to the hospital so let us see what the medical crew will find this lady speaking and what will be the findings on workup of this lady subsequently she was trapped in a elevator as i explained the earthquake is not a routine earthquake let me say it is on richter scale 7.0 or even higher i mean the whole building was literally on the verge of collapsing she is trapped in a elevator during a earthquake that is the scenario or the life threatening episode that i'm talking about and now once she was rescued luckily the lift did not crash the building did not fall like a pack of cards and she has been rescued by the emergency crew but she is all sweaty she is all nervous her hands are shaking and uh, she is suffering from excruciating chest pain at rest it's been only couple of minutes but this chest pain is so bad that the medical crew have make a decision to take her to the hospital and on the way to the hospital even the medic is finding that her hands and feet are cold and clammy the medic is saying sir when we opened the lift we rescued her from the lift that was within few minutes when the earthquake stopped but they saying sir we found that initially she was talking but while we were transporting her in the ambulance she actually stopped talking and her head was lying on one side and we checked the bp it was really very low and her hand and feet were almost icy cold to touch so when i got a call to see this case the moment i put on a monitor or i evaluated the pulse rate of the patient slash heart rate i found that the heart was beating very fast obviously due to catecholamine stimulation but then catecholamine should have contributed to increase in the blood pressure in this patient because i said there can be cardiogenic shock due to catecholamine induced damage to the myocardium that is why blood pressure is low and i'm really worried about this lady why because i am thinking that she could be having even a myocardial infarction no because mi can also occur after intense emotional trauma in fact the first differential diagnosis of the current case that i'm discussing before you is frank myocardial infarction and when i saw the ecg it was showing from v1 to 6 uh, a proper st segment elevation it was a proper classical what i have described earlier the st elevation with a convexity with the t wave inversion present so we had this proper classical party sign present or maybe even he might use the word tombstone pattern both imply i mean when you look at the word tombstone no it it looks like patient is going to go to god so unfortunately i suspect that i'm dealing with a case of anterior wall myocardial infarction the bio marker report is still pending i've decided to take this lady up for a percutaneous coronary intervention because that's the treatment for us mi and uh, while i am planning to take her into the cath lab the report also came of troponin i which was double so i have confirmed the diagnosis of mi i mean i've already explained this to you chest pain at rest in combination with ecg findings of myocardial infarction st elevation convex doubling of uh, trop i this all is definitely going to highlight that this patient is uh, suffering from st mi and even this report is not available still i have to take up the patient in the cath lab now when i have transported the patient to the cath lab we will be taking a excess from the femoral artery of the patient send up a guide wire retrogradely towards the heart and then inject the dye to actually see which blood vessel is thrombosed and in this case mostly it's going to be left main coronary artery but when we looked up the coronary angiogram on the monitor the coronary angiography report of this patient was shockingly normal look at the surprising thing that i'm teaching you i am suspecting that this person is having a st elevation mi on the basis of clinical findings and ecg findings and trop i report is pending maybe come come after some time if person comes early trop i can be normal also it doesn't matter no it will get elevated anyway because there is necrosis in the heart but bottom line is that coronary angiography in this condition is normal which is ruling out the diagnosis of st elevation mi in fact it is like throwing the diagnosis out of the window now when the bedside echocardiography of this patient was performed that is when this surprising finding was formed that there was a gross change in the shape of the left ventricle especially when it comes to the apex it was bulging out like a jar that is used to trap an octopus so therefore the diagnosis of tachycardia cardiomyopathy is usually made in the cath lab and if you do not have a cath lab facility then lots of time this diagnosis will be missed this patient might be even erroneously receiving thrombolysis with no relief because you see if you do thrombolysis in 
you and me or in this person it's gonna not cause any improvement because there is no thrombus in the coronary artery rather it might be counterproductive and it might actually result in death of the patient due to a CNS bleeding so message number one is taco to subo cardiomyopathy slash broken heart syndrome that is the term that our examiners love to use is a differential diagnosis of ST elevation MI the diagnosis of this condition, though it is rare, is made in the cath lab. If we do not have a facility of a cath lab, the case is likely to be missed. And whenever you're going to evaluate the echocardiography of this patient, that's where the gross abnormality or the bulge of the left ventricle would definitely be highlighted. Now, we will focus on what will be the treatment for this condition and that's again something which the examiner would love to ask you in the exam you see because this person is in cardiogenic shock because the myocardium is not working properly it's a stunned myocardium but please appreciate in this condition the reason for stunned myocardium you see st st stunned myocardium means sudden decrease in contractility of the heart in myocardial infarction the sudden decrease in contractility occurs because blood supply is not there in this case blood supply is okay but it is catecholamine induced damage to the myocardium cardium which can actually recover over time so i'm saying another very surprising fact all cardiomyopathies are gonna be having a chronic presentation but taco to subo cardiomyopathy can have an acute presentation and not only an acute presentation it can even show recovery you see when you talk about hocm you need to go in for implantable cardioverter defibrillator and alcohol based septal ablation dilated cardiomyopathy or let me say uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy you need to go in for a cardiac transplantation because it's a flabby heart same is the case with restrictive cardiomyopathy. There's fibrosis in the heart. You need to go for a cardiac transplantation. But in this particular condition, I especially want you to remember that recovery is possible. That's again a highlight of this topic. So I'm going to treat the cardiogenic shock of this patient by deploying various devices. Do not answer dopamine, dobutamine for management of cardiogenic shock of tacotosubo cardiomyopathy because how will dopamine, dobutamine act? They will increase catecholamines. And remember what was the villain in this entire discussion? what was causing the manifestations it was catecholamines so we are not gonna give dopamine dobutamine in fact it's the first time that i am saying person is having cardiogenic shock and do not give dopamine dobutamine to the patient rather we're gonna deploy devices like intra aortic balloon pump iabp that is intra aortic balloon counter pulsation that will take over the function of the left ventricle because left ventricle is anyway malfunctioning the objective of deploying these devices is to improve the coronary perfusion the objective is basically to stabilize the heart per se and along with this as the patient will recover then we can also use ac inhibitors in these patients even beta blockers are used in low dosages so as to control the oxygen consumption so i'm talking about palliative care in this case and the good news is that in all cardiomyopathies do you have a chronic presentation and recovery will not occur pending a transplantation i mean if you do a transplantation obviously he might get his life back or some years of his life will be relatively better without suffering but in this case Studies have shown that if you manage this case and are able to diagnose this case in the cath lab, then recovery is definitely possible in broken heart syndrome. The usual presentation of this question would be after intense emotional trauma. Like if you go through questions of the AIMS exam, the formerly AIMS exam, you will notice that he talked about two brothers who are elderly now. Like both of them are 65, 70 years of age and they had a nasty fight, maybe over a property. And they had such a bad fight that the elder brother, he was so heartbroken that his younger brother had abused him. He used abusive words in front of children of the house that he clutched his chest and he just sat down. And when they took him to the hospital, they thought it is a myocardial infarction. But it was found in the cath lab that it was not a MI. It was actually a taco to subo cardiomyopathy, which is a differential diagnosis of this condition. The next condition that I'll be explaining to you is called as Brugada syndrome. This condition can actually contribute to development of sudden death when it comes to a individual even when he's sleeping. Now suppose a patient came to me and he told me that sir my elder brother had died suddenly in the village. So first thought process of mine would be especially in a village there could be a snake bite. There could be a case of uh, poisoning. There could be actually maybe a suicide by the patient which might be actually made to look due to medical legal reasons as a poisoning. So initially I was very skeptical about the history that was being provided. But this guy said sir my elder brother was also having history of sudden onset palpitations. He did not use the word palpitations but he said that he used to get very nervous and the, the psychiatrist had called this a panic attack. So he says that my elder brother had actually earlier showed to a psychiatrist he was maybe put on anti-anxiety medication but these palpitation episodes dizziness spells continued and the doctor also did not pay much attention to it and one day in his sleep he was found dead. 
well guys what i am teaching you is a condition that you need to have a high index of suspicion what i am teaching you today is a sodium channel defect by the name of scn5a let's understand where this problem is this sodium channel defect is actually found in the epicardium of the right ventricle continue listening very carefully the sodium channel defect is in the epicardium of the right ventricle so therefore because of this defect there is a creation of a voltage gradient now what i mean by voltage gradient is like you have seen the battery in the car of yours so there's a positive terminal there's a negative terminal if you short them if you short them there's going to be sparking similarly here i'm saying there's a voltage gradient created between the endo and the epicardium in you and me the myocardium endocardium epicardium they all the cells will be having i mean after all they cardiac cells so all the cells will be having the same resting membrane potential but in this particular case because of this uh, channel defect there is a voltage gradient created between the outer part of the heart and the inner part of the heart and this voltage gradient can be like a positive and negative terminal of a battery and therefore they can be a short circuit and that short circuit is going to be arrhythmia the usual arrhythmia that can occur in these patients will either be TDP that is torsades de pointis. I have taught you torsades de pointis can occur even with hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia but this could be a presentation in Brugada syndrome and the person may not actually have to do any physical exercise. I'm not talking about somebody who was dancing at a marriage party. I'm not talking about somebody who was maybe doing a lot of running. It is just that this guy was sleeping or maybe he was watching a laughter show, couples laughter show and while laughing died. That's going to be shocking for the family. So most of the time in these patients, sudden cardiac death can occur. And well, how would you as a physician come to know that this disease may be present is when somebody comes to you and says, sir, my, my brother had died suddenly. Maybe even, you know, they suspected some foul play postmortem was done. Size of the heart was normal. That's ruling out HOC. There was no snake bite. There was no poisoning. There was no any kind of, you know, induced i mean something that was actually a suicide which was made to like like a murder or vice versa so i'm ruling out any forensic medicine related you know reasons why a person would be dying what i am saying is there's a short circuit in the heart which will contribute to mortality so this particular patient now now i'm talking about the case per se who has told me that my brother had died he says sir i also complain of similar complaints he says uh, he's let me say 18 to 20 years of age he complains of palpitations dizziness and says that he he has had almost near syncope or syncopal attacks that is when i was trying to link up that okay is he having possibility of wolf parkinson white syndrome long genong levine syndrome long qt syndrome brigada syndrome because the differential diagnosis is fairly big and all the conditions that i just mentioned would be having a family history related to sudden cardiac death in a sibling brother or sister so i said okay let's get your ecg done so every time you are having a patient whom your anxiety medication is not working like somebody came to you initially and you thought that it is a panic spell slash anxiety neurosis you have started the person on anti-anxiety medication if he improves cool but if it does not you should always do a baseline ecg to rule out these rare conditions that i'm talking about ranging from wolf parkinson long genog levine syndrome long qt syndrome short qt syndrome and then brugada as well let us now look at how the ECG of these patients will evolve. So one of the very characteristic ST segment elevation that is found in this condition will be having a concomitant T wave inversion as well. In fact, there are subtypes of it. These subtypes will also be having a different configuration. Like if you look at the second one, I've shown a hump, a hump with respect to the T, T wave. So both that I've highlighted before you are definitely a ST segment elevation, but the nomenclature is different. In the first one, he will say cove pattern. Now this is different from what we have discussed in myocardial infarction. This is different from what we have discussed in pericarditis, which I will sketch back again. I want you to remember that I have today taught you two different types of ST elevation. One is called as saddleback. You can see this depression present here. So that is why it call it, it's called a saddleback. Second is a cove pattern and both of them are representing a ST segment elevation in contrast if when you look at a ecg of a myocardial infarction patient you will definitely notice a convexity with a t wave inversion when you focus on the aspect of pericarditis per se there will be a st elevation with a concavity present i have highlighted both of them once again though i'm very sure you have already practiced these aspects mi versus acute pericarditis in fact four causes of st elevation are right now in this particular part of the slide that i want you to be very comfortable with
If you are able to identify this and the usually the findings of uh, this ST elevation will be encountered in V1 and V2 only. Why mainly in V1, V2 is because that's going to be close to right ventricle. No? I mean V1 can obviously scan the right ventricle. Uh, the defect in these patients is usually found in the epicardium of the right ventricle. So the resting membrane potential or RMP or the electrical circuit that's created. There's a faulty circuit because of the defective uh, uh, sodium influx. So therefore, there's a there's a negative versus a positive. Uh, it's in a relative sense. There's a negative versus a positive terminal created that sh that creates a short circuit and unfortunately causes expiry of this person. I'm not going to let that happen though. So what is going to be the treatment of a person who's suffering from Brugada syndrome or has been diagnosed with Brugada syndrome? Your answer would be given as implantable cardioverter defibrillator. This is going to sense the heart, analyze the heart and if it's going to detect any abnormal rhythm, it's going to fire a DC shock which will result in termination of an arrhythmia. I also want you guys to remember regarding a sodium channel defect which has been discussed in neurology by the name of SCN4A. See the numbers are closely matching guys. SCN5A is for Brugada. SCN4A has been discussed with respect to channelopathy's topic. I'm just going to jot down the names here. One of them is called as hypokalemic periodic paralysis. The second one is referred to as hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. So I want you to remember these details as well because that's important. You see the numbers are going to definitely matter in this case. It is SCN5A versus SCN4A defect. Let's now summarize the indications of implantable cardioverter defibrillator. When are you going to use it so that uh, you can save so many lives? Well, implantable cardioverter defibrillator indications can be remembered by a mnemonic by the name of ABC. Let's look at this easy, very easy mnemonic. Alphabet A would stand for structural defect in the left ventricle that can occur after MI. You see, every time there's a structural defect in the heart, they can be definitely a short circuit. LV aneurysm is one of them. The next one is again a new term that is included in the current editions of the textbook that is ARVD. ARVD is also called as arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. In fact, this is taught or asked in pathology also. So I'll mention two aspects related to arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. It is related to dilated cardiomyopathy but is not exactly a dilated cardiomyopathy. Let me explain why. This condition is mainly characterized by deposition of fat as well as fibrous material. You can imagine fat in the heart wall that is in the myocardium. So when you read regarding fibro fatty deposition in the right ventricle in Brugada, I was not talking about any deposition of anything. I was not talking about any fat or fibrosis developing. I just said a channel is defective. But this time what I'm saying is there's going to be fibrous material fat deposition right ventricle. And this is again going to be a problem because you see this is going to contribute or can contribute to misfiring. And uh, well, the short circuit can result in tachyrhythmias. To identify this condition again, we will be doing a ECG in a patient. So family history of sudden cardiac death can even be present in this case. Or you might have a guy who will just say, sir, I've been to so many psychiatrists, so many physicians. They are loading me with anti-anxiety medication, but I still feel so uncomfortable. And today morning while I was climbing down the stairs, I started feeling dizzy and I fell down. I became unconscious sir. this look there's a big bump on my forehead because I fell down and no doctor is being able to diagnose me or tell me what is wrong with me sir. I don't think so that I'm suffering from anxiety because otherwise I'm okay. It's only that sometimes I get these spells. So I thought okay let's run a ECG on this guy because he's so insistent. And when I ran the ECG on this guy I found a very characteristic finding which is called as epsilon wave and that is itself a uh, a lot of interest to our examiner uh, T wave in this condition may be inverted may not be inverted so I'm saying both are a possibility for T wave but look at this funding that I violated this funding is exactly at J point I've taught you J point isoelectric point I've taught you J wave of hypothermia but this wave that I've highlighted guys is called as epsilon wave this is again important because epsilon wave is going to be very characteristic for arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia and as a result of this epsilon wave or a abnormal discharge in the heart right there's abnormal electrical discharge happening so in in the isoelectric period that can definitely contribute to misfiring and tachyrhythmia tendency 
T wave inversion. I'm just using a short form like they write in the case file. TWI means T wave inversion may or may not be present between V1 to V4. But yes, definitely epsilon wave evidence may be present. And uh, well, this is an important condition. The name itself suggests no arrhythmogenic. So sudden cardiac death can occur. That is why I'm going to put a device that will sense the heart, analyze the arrhythmia, shock it without even the patient coming to know of it. Alphabet B would stand for the channelopathy related to the heart that we studied, Brugada, and C would stand for cardiomyopathy of any etiology. Guys, it can be ischemic cardiomyopathy, it could be hypertrophic, restrictive, dilated cardiomyopathy, any varieties per se, you will ultimately be requiring a implantable cardioverter defibrillator so that you can save the life of these patients and this has been asked in the exam. We can also have misfiring with respect to implantable cardioverter defibrillator because the leads of this can get fractured. Look at the next aspect that I'm gonna say. Please don't note it down. Just follow my words very carefully. This is just for your understanding sake. This is ICD and well, this is gonna be the heart and then we're gonna have some leads. These leads are gonna be touching the heart. They're gonna be sensing the heart. So it's a two-way communication. It's continuously gonna read the signals from the heart if it finds that it's going to misfire, it's going to deliver a DC shock. Now imagine the leads got fractured. Due to stress, the wires that are connecting, you have put in the ICD in the left side of the chest, just below the skin of the chest, infra infraclavicularly, the wires are going down and touching the heart, the lead might get fractured. Now because the lead is fractured, what will this computer get an impression? The computer will get an impression as if the heart is not working or it is misfiring. So what will it do? It will start firing DC shock again and again and again. Look at the funny thing that I'm telling you. The computer is firing DC shock into the soft tissues of the heart because the electrode will be anyway be touching somewhere. So the person will perceive electrical shocks in the chest. Look at the surprising thing that I'm telling you. A person with ICD is actually telling you that sir i perceive as if there are some electrical shocks going on in my chest it causes contraction of chest muscles no so it causes discomfort also he says sir what is going on in this particular guy what investigation will you do was actually the question your answer would be because there's a lead malfunction function and the leads are radiopic so what will we do we'll do a chest x-ray what I've just explained to you is a malfunction with respect to ICD, with respect to a lead fracture, because the computer is not able to sense the heart, it will fire DC shock. I'm not going to use the word misfire because the computer is supposed to fire, the ICD will obviously deliver a DC shock, but it will be delivered to the soft tissues of the chest. So there would be a fluttering sensation in the chest, there would be maybe pain and discomfort in the chest of this person because the computer is stimulating the skeletal muscles of the chest also. As a result of it, when this person comes to you, question said, what investigation? will be done well because these leads are radio opaque the first investigation that you will be doing will obviously be a chest x-ray and uh, well this has been a question that has come a couple of years back in aims exam so i just wanted you to understand the concept behind it or the understanding behind it and let's now just summarize the various reasons why sudden cardiac death has been discussed at multiple times one we have talked about obviously in hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy then i've talked about holiday heart syndrome as well obviously the arrhythmias will vary so i'll just write down the arrhythmias for your practice here as well but let's make a list diabetes mellitus patient can die suddenly then so is the scenario with burgarda which was a sodium channel defect it can be long qt it could be written as lqts it could be short qt syndrome it could be wolf parkinson white syndrome or launganong levine syndrome some important pointers for each one of them in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it's ischemic ventricular fibrillation slash pulseless ventricular tachycardia. In holiday heart syndrome, it is going to be atrial fibrillation. In diabetes velitis, the usual reason why it can happen is silent MI slash hypoglycemic unawareness. In Brugada syndrome, again, it could be any of the usual arrhythmias like TDP or ventricular tachycardia. Long QT syndrome again predisposes to torsidus depointus. That's again an important point and one of the important causes of long QT can be hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia. Wolf Parkinson White syndrome and Launganog Levine syndrome in these patients it will mostly be again a tachyrhythmia where there's a possibility that atrial fibrillation can degenerate into ventricular fibrillation. Look at the surprising thing I'm teaching you because in WPW the bundle of Kent will not have a decremental property. That is why atrial fibrillation can directly degenerate into ventricular fibrillation. Otherwise, it will not happen. In a normal person, if atrial fibrillation is occurring, it will not translate into ventricular fibrillation. Why? Because AV node is sitting in between. So the AV node will act like a gatekeeper. It will stop the impulses of the atria trying to go down into the ventricles. But if there's a bypass pathway, like bundle of Kent present, 
in those circumstances you would rather be having a degeneration of atrial fibrillation into ventricular fibrillation i mean this is one scenario where there's a accessory pathway present in the heart this accessory pathway could be like bundle of kent which could result in these manifestations developing in a patient so i definitely want you to remember causes of sad sudden cardiac death over and above this, I would just like to remind you regarding the delta wave that we always study in Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome or about the peculiar ST elevation in lead V1, V2 that I was talking about, especially the cove pattern or saddle back pattern, which can definitely be asked. And if you just get these facts right, you would be on your way to getting questions right on this particular subtopic. Thank you so much for hearing me out and keep hammering, keep learning guys, and you'll come out with flying colors.